first Métis were children of indigenous women and European fur traders in the Red River area, now known as Manitoba. It dates back to as early as 1973 during the Alexander Mackenzie expedition. The Métis people developed their own language called Michif, which is a unique blend of French and the Cree language that is still used today. Roughly 33% of all Canada's Aboriginal population is Métis. Métis means mixed. The Métis Nation Blue Infinity Flag is the oldest continuous used flag in Canada and it represents the mixing of two cultures. Métis were often called flower beadwork people due to their combination of French floral embroidery mixed with Aboriginal porcupine quilt work. Métis are well known for their finger woven sash, which is referred to as l'assumption sash, and it is the most recognizable symbol of Métis heritage. The sash was often used as a belt, tow rope, tump line, or even as a sewing kit. They're made of wool. Louis Riel was a Canadian politician, a founder of the province of Manitoba, and a political leader of the Métis people. He led two resistance movements against the government of Canada and its first Prime Minister, John A. Macdonald. Riel sought to defend Métis rights and identity as the Northwest Territories came progressively under the Canadian sphere of influence. Louis Riel Day is on November 16th. The Métis Nation of British Columbia was founded in 1996 and is still going strong today. All right, Dan, well, listen, thank you for being a part of the uh, Northeast BC Métis Storytelling Project. This project is meant to uh, have elders and different people uh, that are Métis to share their wisdom and teachings. Uh, and the goal with this project is um, basically to record them and pass them along so that future generations or anyone along their walk of life um, can look back on some of these interviews and perhaps um, either you know, identify with some of those stories and connect and definitely find some new wisdom and knowledge that they weren't exposed to before. So thank you for being a part of the project. Um, so with that in mind, can I get you to please tell me your first or your full name? How about that? It's George Daniel Pope. Okay, George Daniel Pope. So look at that. And you go by Daniel though. Correct. May I ask why? Well, it, it's just the, the name I grew up with. I find now in this day and age when names and such are so, you know, how would you put it there, so legal. Uh, when I worked for MNBC before I was the regional director, our gal in the head office used to have my, just use my second name on the plane tickets. But after uh, the 2000 and what is it, one uh, tow Twin Towers, then of course they got sticky and then all of a sudden using my second name wasn't good enough. You know, it had to be who I was, whoever it showed on your birth certificate or passport. So even now, like doing any business, I go by George. You know, unless it's somebody that I know like this, uh, but I use my second name, family and friends. But is any, anything serious or any new business or anything, I use my first name. So growing up then, you were known as Dan? Daniel. Yes, yes. Okay. And uh, let's talk about um, your family name then, Pope. Now, is there Métis heritage in that last name? Yes, when, when you look, uh, I have uh, our genealogy from both sides. On my mother's side, it's La Riviere. And then, of course, on my dad's side, it's Pope. And I have the genealogy for both sides. And there is uh, our, our Métis heritage on both sides, you know. And... Uh, the genealogy I have that I've used for my citizenship comes from my mom's side. Okay, so why don't we start with your mom's side, if that's right. Le Riviere, yes. Well, I mean, I spent uh, many summer holidays in that, in High Prairie, Gruard, the colony in that, where my grandparents lived. And uh, oh, joyful times, we, one of my brothers and, uh, or one of my sisters and I would, back in the day, there was the train that would come to Dawson Creek, and we'd get on the train and travel to uh, High Prairie, and then our grandparents would pick us up, and we'd spend part of the summer down at their farm. It was great. You know, uh, one of my regrets, while I'm speaking of that, is uh, one of our kokums. I remember to this day, it's like uh, when I was telling you the little story about uh, Learn, you know, only to learn the language. And uh, we used to have to go out every now and then, one of my aunts and I, 
put the kokum and dig up roots for plants, mm -hmm. you know, our cultural heritage for medicines and that. And it was all, you know, when you're nine and ten years old, the last thing you want to do is going out and digging up roots and different plants that uh, Kokum would mix with berries, and she'd be telling us, and dig this up and telling us why, but for us, it's a nice sunny day. I think, yeah, I know what am I going to be here? <laughs> Both of us. It's one of those things that, as far as our culture goes, that's a lost thing, and, and I regret, but lots of regrets like that. And then the language. When I'm growing up, uh, not so much my dad, but my mom was fluent in Cree, you know, and, Machif, our cultural language, and I learned that. My grandparents in High Prairie, that's all they spoke, so I learned the language. But as I grew older, went away from it, and I'm uh, through Jacqueline here. We, she had started uh, a cultural program to learn our language again, and then of course the pandemic and the COVID there that kind of sidetracked that. But back learning it again, you only say Tansi Kiwa. What does that mean? How are you? Oh, I'm good, thanks. <laughs> and how do you say that? Yeah. How do you say I'm good, thank you? Uh, one of the things that I regret, you know, uh, I do know it somewhere, and, and somebody says, Tansi, hello. Oh. You know, you know, somebody says, Soniao, money. Money. Oh, I've heard that one before. Okay. <laughs> we all know that one. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. And uh, what about your dad's side of the family? Can you tell Pope? Well, uh, as a matter of fact, I'm named after both uh, gran both grandpas. Oh, okay. George was my dad's dad, and Daniel was my mom's dad. Oh. So, uh, uh, Pope, well, I mean, we uh, grew up, were born and raised here in Fort St. John, and uh, my dad... Uh, was a truck driver, drove truck, and in later years worked for the school board. But uh, our grandpa had a little little house just on our property that he lived in. Mm -hmm. You know, spent lots of time, learned lots of things from my grandpa, how to skin, you know, small animals. Because back in my day, Merlin, you could, the Hudson Bay store was the one you probably see in pictures. You know, you could take a hide in there and there'd be hides you know, that they, you would go in and sell. And I remember uh, one of our cats had killed a weasel. And uh, my grandpa showed me how to skin it, put it on a board to stretch it. And, and him and I took it up to uh, the Hudson Bay store. Didn't get what I thought I'd get because the cat had kind of ambushed this weasel. He'd see the claw marks in the back of the weasel's back and neck. So I got, I think I got 25 cents. <laughs> But, you know, back in the day, in, uh, well, there was nothing here. I think there was one house where this building is now. I forget who, but other than that, I think the town was, what, a couple of hundred, if that. Wow. Dirt streets and everything else, you know. Uh, and, I mean, uh, everything changed in the early 50s and they discovered natural gas. That, boom, it's like overnight. The town just flourished, and it's been flourishing ever since. And Did you mostly grow up in Fort St. John then? Yes. Okay, so born and raised in Fort St. John. Yes. And so you went to school here? Yes. Okay, and so elementary, high school? Yes. And then did you continue schooling after that, or did you go right into the workforce? Oh, well, I worked, uh, I uh, drove truck, uh, went to work at uh, the Bennett Dam, Went to work, actually, I moved to Nanaimo, worked there for a company called Ocean Cement, learned how to drive truck, and uh, through my dad, my oldest brother, truck drivers, and, uh, and come up here to the Bennett Dam to work, and then uh, drove truck for a while and realized that there was more, so looked into the trades, and as I say, I'm a ticketed plumber and uh, pipe fitter by trade, gas fitter, uh, never looked back. And, and I say this to all the young people out there, back in my day, I remember in, in high school, there was, uh, when you graduated, they had kind of a careers day. You know, and uh, the different entities would come around, doctor, lawyer, there was no Indian chief then, but, uh, you know, and I remember coming around talking, and of course, the armed forces and such. And it was almost an afterthought for some of them to say, oh, 
by the way, Marilyn, if you can't do anything else, you can always be a tradesman. Really? That's what really? you presented it to that, you? That was kind of the after, afterthought? Well, there was always the trades, but they were never forefront like they are now and the, uh, the shortage that's coming. So all you young people out there, never mind going to university where you're deep in debt forever and you come out of school and you're wondering what you're going to do. As a tradesman, you get paid while you learn. You go to school, you start out at a, well, if you go to trade school to start with or learn on the job, I know I went to BCIT, and uh, when you, I'd done the six-month pre-app. When you come out of trade school, went to work, I come from organized labor, of course, uh, the UA, and uh, you get 55% of a journeyman's rate. So you can figure 55% of a journeyman's rate when I think our rate is 48 or 49 and change. Back in my day, I think it was half of that. But still, when you start out, say at 12 or 13 dollars an hour, I'm going back to 1974. That was good money. Yeah, a very good start. And raise every six months, go to school once a year. And the difference between a tradesman qualifying and uh, many other skills and professions is that a tradesman, in order to pass, you have to have 70% pass average. For my gas ticket, it was 80% pass average. I don't know what you're doing. Yes, math, and I say this to all the young people, math, math is critical, like most trades and skills are. Of course, yeah. Okay, well, I got ahead of myself there, but I was just curious, you know, yeah. uh, yes. where your roots were, but um, let's keep going down maybe the line of uh, you growing up. So you were growing up here. What was it like growing up in Fort St. John? Oh, it was great, you know. Uh, I remember like days like this in the winter time. Where we lived down on 98th uh, Avenue there, we were just across from the old curling rink. And in the wintertime when it was 30, 40 below, you were outside, we had one street light, not like they are today, this is the old, whatever they were, 200 watt, play hockey on the, on the road, you know, roads frozen, there were there no pavement, of course. Uh, and then across from the curling rink, and one of the big things we used to do was uh, get on behind a car, hang onto the bumper, and the car would go and you'd be sliding. <laughs> That's hilarious. You know, this was at night, of course, you know. Who would drive? No, no, not us. Just as people were leaving the curling rink and say they, they'd be at a stop sign, oh. you'd come out of nowhere and two or three of us grab onto the bumper and the way they'd go and you'd be sliding down the road. Every now and then you might hit a bear patch and that, <laughs> Either jerked you off the. And let me tell you a little story. I lost a pair of mitts. I, you know, back in the had the inside the bumper holding on. Yeah. And it stopped suddenly, and I couldn't get my hands out. The next night, or a day or two later, that same vehicle was there at the curling rink, and my mitts were still there. <laughs> wow, luck was on your side. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, okay, let's talk about maybe. Um, Siblings. Did you have any siblings growing up? Oh, yes. How many? Well, I had I have a couple that aren't here with us now, but uh, I had three other brothers and five sisters. Okay, and where are you in all that? I'm the second oldest. Brother Glenn is the oldest, and then I'm next. And then there's Sister Peg, and then there was Brother Alan, and uh, Brother Gerald, and then I have a number of sisters. Gotcha. And... Um, <clears throat> Growing up, um, did you have any particular um, like jobs you had to do around the house or anything that was your responsibility? Oh, we, you know, uh, cut wood, chop wood, wood stove. We used to do that haul wood in for mom. Uh, we lived in just a small little house for all of us. I don't know how we managed, but back then... You made it work. You did, you know. Uh, you know, I mean, you helped out around the house and everything else. That was part of the growing up. I mean, it was just a given. You know, watch over your sisters and younger brothers, you know. And what do you, what are some of your fondest memories of growing up uh, with your family? If you had to look back. Oh, just, you know, when you think about it, I mean, it, it's every day. So as far as fondest memories, I guess it's just all of us being together. You know, even though at times you think, gee, what's, you know. 
all these other brothers and sisters, but that's part of the sibling thing, you know. But it, it, it was just being together, I think, you know. As far as any particular memory sticking out, I mean, uh, as things life went on, we used to, uh, I remember my dad had a Volkswagen van, and then we used to make a trip down to High Prairie, all of us. My older brother, Glenn, was, uh, he was, I think, gone by then, but there would be myself and the rest, so there'd be eight of us in this Volkswagen van and uh, travel down there, you know, but very different then. Uh, you know, no staying in motels, there were very few, and, you know, we, my parents weren't the richest on the block, so, but memories like that, we were all together. Family times, and as I say, as far as any one particular, all oh, little things, you know, uh, not all of us, but some of my brothers and I, the younger brothers, go down to the old dump. You know, and, and you walked everywhere. I mean, yeah. very few vehicles, and uh, usually be, you know, a couple of us and uh, two or three family friends and a pack of dogs. <laughs> Like the cave, you, you know about this cave out here at Charlie Lake? Oh, I think I've heard of it, but I've never actually been. Okay. Well, back in my day, we used to go out to Charlie Lake and we'd stop at that cave, crawl in there, and you see all the etchings. But it, it wasn't a big deal, it was just a stopping point, and we'd go on to Charlie Lake and swim in the lake, walk there and walk back. You know, follow the little trail there. But I mean, that was just part of the life of growing up, you know, there, there was never any credence as far as what we had discovered. I mean, it was known to lots of people, I'm sure. Yeah. You know, and it, it is uh, a secluded place. Back then, you know, there was a big rock bluff in front of it and in the cave. It was kind of, a, you went in one, then you had to get right down because it was so packed over the years. And go in there and see all the etchings. Probably added a few of our own. <laughs> there you go. Now, can I ask maybe, do you remember any any turbulent or any difficult times that come to your mind over your time growing up? Any struggles? Yes. Uh, our mother had passed on when I was uh, 16. That's right, hear that. So just my dad left to look after all of us. Uh, so that, that was tough then. Yeah, that was a tough time, you know, losing mom and uh, the younger sisters and that were really young, you know, so looking after them, <clears throat> but my dad endured, looked after all of us, you know, and uh, yeah, but you know, that was probably the, uh, growing up then, that was probably the biggest thing that happened for us all, you know, and how it affects you as life goes on. Well, that's true. Now, you, I know you were talking about how you would go to your grandparents and they would sort of take you out to pick all sorts of like, you know, fruits and different things yeah, and medicine. Well, yeah. Were there any traditions that your parents or your grandparents kept alive when you were younger? They were Métis? Uh, I, I don't, I'm just trying to recall. I mean, there are lots of things we've done that, you see, and, and one of the things that we uh, you have to remember, Marlon, is that back in the day, you see, right around then was that residential school thing. So we didn't, we weren't told a lot about our culture till growing up, because I'm sure mom and dad were leery of all of us and, and with what the, the government of the day had done, trying to change us, you know. Uh, hopefully there's lessons to be learned in society for us, you know, and that we, as a culture, and I know sometimes you look at some of these different groups worldwide, you, we kind of look our nose down and think, how terrible, you know, but we shouldn't look too far away when we think of what happened to the residential schools and such. But part of that, was, I think, was one of the reasons why we never learned our culture. I remember friends uh, coming to the house and, and mom and them would, would speak our cultural language, but as far as learning it, from my mom or dad, very low-key. Okay. So, 
how old were you by the time uh, you ended up moving out? Well, I mean, once I uh, got out of high school and that, and, uh, you know, worked around town for a little bit, you know, uh, by then it was just uh, my dad looking after us. So, you know, go and help the family a little bit. And then uh, moved to Nanaimo and, and start working there and learn how to drive. How old were you at that point? Oh, probably uh, hmm, 18, 19. You know, so it spent two or three years here, worked on the oil rigs here. You know, back then, they say in the early 50s, changed everything here when they discovered a little bit of oil, but mainly natural gas. So, uh, you know, worked on the oil rigs, good money then, you know. Uh, it's like today, back then, you, if you stayed in a camp, of course, everything was free room and board, you know, uh, so it didn't cost you any money that way. So, you know, Made a few bucks there, then moved to the coast, and then uh, eventually back here to work at the Bennett Dam. Gotcha. And then that's where you started doing your training. Well, and, and then, you know, after I worked there for, for a while, and then uh, went to Micah Dam, worked there at the dam there. And that's when I really was looking around. And there's nothing wrong with being uh, a truck driver, you know, professional trucker, honorable trade skill. But... Uh, thought, no, what else do I want to do? And, you know, so places like that, you get a chance to see all the different trades. So you look at it this way, and I say this again to the young people. The three trades that span your residential, commercial, and construction are carpentry, plumbing, and electrical. Now, there's all, nothing wrong with the other trades, it's just that the number of them they don't, they don't usually, you don't see a, a boiler maker in, in a residential, you know, uh, commercial maybe a little bit, but definitely construction and such, you know. So those are the three trades. So, you know, I mean, after seeing that, you think, well, all right, you know, be a plumber. Everybody needs a plumber. <laughs> Me too. Especially do. now. <laughs> yeah, when it gets this cold. Um, okay. And... Um, did you, uh, so, uh, you know, you came back, you started working for the dam, and then um, who would you say at that point, or maybe we can even take a little bit further than that, but who would you say was the most influential person of your life up until that moment? Who would you say, there are any parents, any siblings that say? Well, probably, uh, I learned a lot from my older brother, Glenn. There's four years difference. Learned how to drive truck. He showed me how to drive truck. Learned some good lessons from him and my dad, you know. Uh, and, and just, you know, uncles. I remember a couple of my uncles on my mom's side. I remember a little story. Let me tell you a little story about Uncle Howard. He was staying with us. Just That's when, as they say, the uh, oil field work started. They come up. And I remember walking uptown one day. We were actually going home. And... Uh, God rest your soul, Uncle Howard. He had told me that I was walking too slow. Okay. Told me to keep ahead of him, otherwise if he didn't, if he caught up to me, he was gonna kick me in the backside. <laughs> <laughs> but things like that from the different uncles. Yeah. Uh, the time I spent in Europe, my Uncle Pat, he uh, worked in the oil field. He was, uh, worked on one of those offshore platforms in the North Sea and uh, Went to see him in uh, Stavanger, Norway. I had went and visited one of my uncles and aunt. Uh, they lived in England, in uh, Norwich, England. Taster by the sea, a little resort. And took uh, a young cousin of mine, and him and I went to Norway, traveling on the trains. It was great. Uh, but I had a chance to stay there because I'd worked in the oil field here. He'd asked me uh, if I had an interest to go and work on one of those offshore platforms. But I'd already just started my trade here. Otherwise, I might have considered it. You know, it, uh, you know, big thing back then. The money was great, you know. Uh, but I, I, I stayed there for a while and then come back and come back home here and then lived in Vancouver for oh, 
decade, decade and a half learner might read. Okay. So when, let's switch over maybe to maybe the time when you became a family man, because you were telling me that you've been married for is it 46 or 40 some odd years? Yes. And so where did you, or when and where did you meet your wife? Oh, I, when I was working in my trade, my wife was teaching school in Clearwater, just north of Kamloops. Okay. They were renovating a school there, and I went to work for an outfit, and they were put, put in a new boiler and uh, different bathroom groups, because originally it was a high school. So when they changed the bathroom groups, they had to put smaller water closets in and everything, and a sink in every room, which wasn't there before. And, uh, you know, a number of school teachers and met my good wife. You know, we kind of just progressed from there. That's nice. And did you guys have children? Oh, yes. We have three daughters. Uh, we have a set of identical twins. And our oldest daughter, Domini, she is the general manager for Burger King. Matter of fact, before I come in, I was just talking to her. She and our oldest granddaughter are on the way to Grand Prairie. She's the general manager. She looks after the Burger King here, the one in Dawson, and they just opened there's two in Grand Prairie. They just opened a new one in Grand Prairie, so they were traveling over there. Mm -hmm. So, and then our, our twins, Alicia is the youngest twin. Samantha, her older sister by 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, Alicia lives here. She's the lead draftsman for McElhaney. And uh, Samantha, her older sister, lives in uh, Washington State. And her, her husband is... Uh, he is a, uh, oh, what does he do? He's a, an engineer gotcha. for Microsoft. Gotcha. So did you pass on, I, I mean, you know, world changed in all those years for you. Did you pass on any of that Métis heritage to your kids? Yes. Oh, yes, yes. They were aware of, of their culture, you know, and what it is. Uh, have their grandchildren, the one granddaughter, just waiting to get her citizenship card. And our, the twins have theirs. The oldest daughter, Domini, she's aware of it, but hasn't got there yet. I mean, it's not that she's against it, but just doing their thing. But uh, certainly our twins are aware of their culture. Matter of fact, the youngest twin, Alicia, she, I think, in the past had sat on a community board here. Oh, wow. That's really nice. So is it nice to then share that with your children now? and to be able to, you know, actually live within that culture? Well, it, when you say live within the culture, I mean, it, as far as you say, now, what is living within your culture? The way things are today, you know, you practice all the things like some of the stories I was telling you, yep. you know, uh, things like that. And then just pass on little bits of information that you've learned. So as far as living within the culture, I mean, I, I don't know if you'd call it things that you grow up with and learn you pass along as to whether your children accept them. You know, I mean, they're, they're grown adults and uh, they're certainly aware of their, their culture and everything. Matter of fact, you say that the youngest granddaughter, not the youngest, but the second youngest here, uh, her and I have done a number of little school projects where they have a, an indigenous day. And I've, her and I have gone to the school. I've gone with her and... Uh, taken uh, a sash and uh, put together a little project for the class, you know, showing uh, the Red River cart and, and some of the housing that we lived in, you know, and uh, just giving them, her uh, classmates, a little culture of our culture, you know, and, and uh, I think at times they refer to, and I don't mean any malice to anyone here, you're watching, you know, that, uh, when they say indigenous, there was more to being indigenous than First Nations. There was the Métis and Inuit. And, and we are a culture, and as you know, as you go down through life, you learn more about our culture. We were the business people. We were the go-between, between the, the Muniaus, as you know, white person, and, and uh, indigenous, the Métis. And every now and then, here in the paper in the, go in the days gone by, Larry Evans writes about uh, some of the history and the different parts of it involved our culture. You know, like uh, 
one little story that sticks with me was he writes about uh, back in the day when the gold rush was coming, uh, some of the Mooney Owls were taking horses, but he had, in the article it says that there were a number of Métis that had come to the area and he knew they were going to raise a ruckus about these horses being taken and nothing being said. But that's part of our culture, you know. And, and without being political, but I'm going to say it, if we got together as an indigenous group, Métis, First Nations, we wouldn't have to listen at the door. We could get together and we could elect people to be provincially, federally, like other indigenous groups that have come to this country and done all so very well by doing that. So I say to us out there, let's come together. No matter and fight each other and who's first, let's just live together. We can elect somebody. We can be in parliament there. We can help change things. That's right. That's right. And thank you for passing that on because those are the stories and those are the things that people that are younger need to hear that haven't been exposed to it or were around when it wasn't, where, or when it was so different, like yourself, like you were, you lived through those days. That's right. Well, and, and let me tell you, and I don't know how much you added to this, but I'll tell you this other little story. Yeah. When I was uh, regional director in Canada, back in the day, they had, uh, it was kind of an oil and gas play up north of Fort Nelson. So they approached us, Andy Popko, how are you doing, Andy? Andy was uh, looked after all our indigenous side. He brought us together, us and all the groups in Treaty 8 and the Métis, brought us together. And that was when oil was at $55 a barrel. The idea was bring all the groups together, put in X amount of dollars. You know, they in Canada then it was trying to do us a favor, you know. Bring us together was one group. It was easy, would have been easier for the industry. They wanted us to come together to form a company. So when the industry was dealing with us, they wouldn't have to deal with each separate group. They could say, just go to the office, you know, and say, Marlon, all right, we're going to do uh, something up here. It's up to you to look after it. Get your people together from the different areas. We need people up there, whatever. You think we could even get past the company name? And I won't get too political here of how things went, uh, but it, it didn't happen. And, and it was, I had calls from Suncor and various oil companies, that people that I knew, and said to me, because they knew what was going on, they said, if this works, if you indigenous groups can form a company, come and see me, come and see us. We can put together, like in what it was up there, it was an oil play, but some of the groups wanted more so in Canada relented and said, all right, if what it was going to be was a number of the small plays, oil and gas plays. Would, would they were going to put pipelines in, bring them together in a bigger place and everything. So a number of the, not so much us then, because we didn't have this, the Sony out to have our company people in that, like First Nations or in the other indigenous groups. So the idea was that they would, uh, in Canada, relented and said, all right, well, let's just bring trucks on and do some of the work at some of these little facilities. They were just putting gathering lines in from, from some of the smaller facilities into a bigger facility and a bigger pipeline and so on. It would have been great, you know, and the industry was just waiting for us. But fought amongst each other and couldn't get it together. Hmm. What do you think were the biggest hurdles? Like why was it so difficult? Because they fought amongst each other. They didn't want us there to start with the Métis. And Andy said, if they're not there, nobody's there. And it was X amount of dollars from each group to come together for this uh, play north of Fort Nelson. McTamish is what it was. Oh, okay. And uh, uh, this fight and fight. Them. It, it just frustrating. That I get frustrated to this day to think of the opportunity that we had, and it never, never come to pass. And, and that's why I'm saying now, if we, you know, if we can come together as an indigenous group provincially, 
from each one of the areas and you elect people, never mind that uh, whatever your political stripe is. We get together as long as we're all on the same page. And we get together and if we're on the same page and we elect people from the same political party, and instead of listening at the door, we can be making the rules or help make the rules in government when you sit at the table. Federally, we had the chance, but uh, I don't know. I <laughs> want to get into that. <laughs> That's okay. Don't worry. Now, why don't we talk about a little bit about uh, maybe community life. Now, um, did you growing up or yourself uh, when you had a family, did you guys get involved in any community events or um, I know now you say that you and your children are part of are involved with the May D Society, but were you guys were you involved from a earlier stage of your life or when did that, all that come about? Well, it, it probably never happened till I moved back here because growing up and, and then uh, like you say when when I was married, uh, we lived in Kamloops. Uh, that's where we started our family, actually in Revelstoke, when I worked at the Revelstoke Dam there. And, uh, you know, moved from there to Kamloops and then up here. So once we were kind of settled and our children were a little older, I, I wouldn't say that uh, we're totally involved in, in our culture. There wasn't a lot going on back in the day. And then uh, Jean Peerless, thank you, Jean, uh, was a former community president got involved there, she had asked me to run for regional director. And I did, because I was a regional director here for a couple of terms. And, uh, you know, then of course, you were involved. Then, and by then, you know, we were a little stronger. Uh, you know, we used to go to the various AGMs. We had one here, and in Dawson, Salmon Arm. Then we, as, as a Métis culture, started to come together. Uh, it was great. I like to think that uh, we played a role in shaping our culture and, and where we stand now today moving forward. And of course, now that we've been recognized a little more and uh, governments of the day recognize us and of course you're getting that seed money, if you will, to get started. Projects like this, which we need to be out there, and I see uh, advertised even on Global, about being Métis and joining the community and little bits about different little things we do, and that's great to see. I would like to see more done. I would like to see, like, uh, obviously, uh, you've been to YVR many times, eh? No, I haven't. Are you, why, are you talking about, uh, the, which airport is that? Vancouver. I've been a yeah, a couple times. Yeah. There we go. I always get it confused with the uh, Calgary airport. Okay. <laughs> Calgary, if I ever fly out of there again, it'll be too soon. Yeah. Another story. But YVR, if you've been there, you see that big, uh, it's made out of oh, jade, is it? Excellent big jade thing that encompasses the indigenous groups there. Oh, okay. But I would like to see something like that from our culture. I think we have to be more involved. Uh, I think we are coming there slowly, 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 but uh, I just feel that we're doing the recognition governments, federally, provincially, and we as a culture, you too, have to become more involved and doing little projects like this puts it out there and thank you for doing it. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for being a part of it. Um, we were going down the, the line of, of community life. So I guess now that you are a part of the, the Métis um, Society, have there been any projects that stand under your mind that you've uh, been a part of in the past few years or anything that you think? Uh, oh, yes. I'll tell you, I also, uh, I also am part of uh, Kelly Lake. Oh, okay. I you know, help Curtis, the new president there. Kelly Lake is probably, if, it's probably the only recognized Métis community in BC. I don't know if there's any other. Wow. And it's, it's a place for you to go to. 
Well, then you should go over there. And depending on how much time you have here, we can, I'll take you there. It's only two or three hours there. And why do you say go there specifically? Because what they need there, and, and their head has been done, uh, the CEO and a number of uh, people from the head office come up there earlier in the year, a number of people here. We went down to Kelly Lake for the housing needs there, and it's atrocious. It's atrocious that, that uh, people, governments of the day, would let that go. People there are in dire need of their homes being fixed. And what Curtis Belcourt, the community president there, and the newly formed community group uh, recognized, just, just got recognized by government and MNBC. And what we have going, what we want to try and do because of my trade, and Curtis has a little company there. Mm -hmm. We want to put water and sewer to every home. A number of the oil companies have expressed an interest in helping, and that's my project. And besides, you know, depending on what happens here, being a community elder, but to me, being the community elder is a regional elder, I hope, <laughs> not just here. And that's one of the things that, because of my trade, you know, and spent years in construction, worked for a number of years down at the plant, run jobs, looked after jobs, you know, uh, big construction jobs and such. So it kind of comes full circle. Yes. And that's really awesome that you want to be able to share that knowledge and, you know, share it with your community. Right? Yes. And help that. Way. Well, you, you want to move things forward for people in general, but especially our, our community people. And when you see the people over there in Kelly Lake, some of the atrocious housing, you think governments. I, I, when I was a regional director, I, I went to the government, uh, I'm trying to remember the, uh, the, the MP that was in Dawson back then, good guy, went to him. And there again, this is a little knock, but I've got to say it anyway. One of the biggest things, and people know this, Marlon, one of the biggest things there in Kelly Lake is there's three or four groups. Everyone wants to be number one. They have a school there, big, beautiful school that they don't use. They use it as a community center, but the children in the community go to school in Hythe, which is in Alberta, just across the border. The border to Kelly Lake is only, say, from oh, down to the end of the block down here, and you're in Alberta. Mm -hmm. Biggest thing they said in talking to the MP and different people that know, trying to bring these three or four people that, that want to be first together. The needs of the many outweigh the wants of the few. That's very true. Yeah, that, that's what helps people also come together. There again, I mean, that, that not only, say, within our culture, that society as a whole, as you know. I mean, you, you see it everywhere. That's right. Yeah. Um, now, that being said, and, and you wanting to be a part of all that, uh, can I ask maybe then, What's in your life inspired you or um, maybe helped you through the tough times or to want to help your community? What, where does that come from then? That's just part of growing up. As I say, growing up, we weren't the richest on the block by any stretch, you know. Uh, you know, and then uh, just growing up, I mean, you know, always had lots to eat, had a big garden. Uh, let me tell you another little story. When I was in grade Ten, I think. Uh, you know, eat different blocks. You get to choose your subjects. So there was a couple of things. So the only thing left in this one block I had to take was agriculture. Now, if you're a farm boy or girl, it was a given. You know, you'd raise a cow or something or a herd of horses, whatever. You know, or a couple acres a week. So for me, my grandpa George. We always had a big garden, had a big lot. So we always had a big garden with a big family, of course. Big garden was a must. So I said, I'll, uh, I told uh, the teacher, I said, what I can do is uh, I'll plant some potatoes. <laughs> so I got up with my grandpapa and, uh, you know, help plant the potatoes. And uh, the agriculture teacher said that he'd be around probably the first or second week in July after school got out 
to uh, you know come and see, and it was worth fifty percent of your mark. Oh, it's a big chunk. So of course uh, I done that, but I must admit, and Grandpa would only chastise me, and he knows if he's looking down, that I done very little. After help plant the potatoes, and you know you got a home. But I must say that I was, I was gone lots. I had too many things to do. At summertime, you know, you're, you know, grade ten. I had other interests by then. <laughs> So and, and I hung around for the first week, sticking close to the home, so in case the agriculture teacher come around, I could at least say that I helped a little. But of course, you know how it goes, Murphy's Law, the day I was gone, the day he come to the house. So Grandpa, I mean, he's not going to lie for, for me. He said, well, he said, uh, he helped me get started. He said, but uh, I haven't seen him since. So, needless to say, I didn't get the other 50%. I got a little bit of percentage for helping, but as far as hoeing and everything else, no. Nah. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, that's good that, that that spirit and all that comes from, at least from some of that. Well, and, and that, it's things like that when you're growing up, well, and that, that come to light that you pass on. And it's not a case of always known. It's when these little things happen that the memory way back here, you think, ha ha. You know, like little stories, you know. I remember going hunting with my dad and my, one of my uncles, Uncle Eddie, be my dad's brother and his family. They grew up here too. They had a big family. But I remember going hunting, you know, and uh, we didn't have any big wall tents. You just slept out yeah, and my dad and them that knew how to read sign, you know. I mean, I'm going back when, uh, like, uh, have you been to Fort Nelson? I haven't yet, no. Is this as far as you've been? Uh, that's right, we're St. John. Oh, well, you got to come back here in the summertime. Take you to Fort Nelson. It's, I don't know, five hours, five and a half hours. From yep, I'm worried of it. You know, and then from there, and uh, we'll go to the hot springs. I've heard. Liard Hot Springs. My wife and I really want to go. And you should. It, it's, I don't know what it's like now, but a number of years ago, when my good wife and I went up there, natural setting, I don't know what they've done. It's not like, say, some of the other hot springs where it's all concrete. Not there then, there was a boardwalk. You went across kind of a, these hot and water bubbling, and then you went to the pool. And there, they had a boardwalk and change rooms. And then you got down in the water. Oh, just bath water. Oof. <laughs> and the further upstream you went, they had kind of a, they'd built kind of a rock wall. On this side of the rock wall, the water was bubbling, and then it come over top. And then further down you sat, the cooler it got. But it's cleansing. You sit in there, you know, you can smell the sulfur. But it's a place you got to go. And I think one of the uh, indigenous groups, First Nations, have bought the facility that used to be owned by somebody else, non-indigenous. And uh, as I say, I don't know what it's like now, but the next time you're coming the summer when the days are long, and uh, you know, make a trip to Fort Nelson. I, I'm not sure. I believe there's a, uh, I don't know if there's a Métis Society. There used to be when I was uh, the regional director. I had a Métis Society in Fort Nelson. Plus, just in my trade, big gas plant. We used to work there for the, go up there in big shutdowns. Okay. And Dan, before we started the, the interview, uh, you were telling me that, um, about your faith, that you were brought up Catholic. Now, how has that played a part in your life? As I said to you, we uh, went, to, went to church. I wouldn't say we went every Sunday. And then, as I say, we had the, the chance. Mom had said you could go to catechism every Sunday which we didn't, but then we had to go for 10 days out of our summer holidays, just after the long weekend, just like school, 9 to 3, and you learned, uh, catechism, learned about your religion. Right. You know, and then once we got confirmed, then Mom had said, then, then the choice is yours if you want to continue. And, uh, it, you know, at, at the time, of course, but certainly learning the religion you know, uh, wasn't a bad thing. I have my own beliefs, you know, in that, uh, like it, in our religion, if, if you're Catholic, you would know this idea of, of going to confession. I mean, I, 
never as an altar boy, of course you had to go to confession because you had to you had to get the host and you know let me tell you another little story. We're in uh, we're going to catechism, another friend of mine, Larry Pym. Larry and I are serving mass. And uh and you know, I don't the host you know, one one altar boy would hold the plate, you know. And then the father would have the chalice, the cup, and giving out the little hosts and everything. So one Sunday, church is just packed, as it was every Sunday. And I'm uh, sitting, because it just the one altar boy held a little gold plate, you know, underneath, so in case it, you missed the host or we dropped it. It didn't fall on the floor. Fell on a little. So he's holding it. But the father, whatever, or the person receiving it, missed it. And it hit the plate, but it was on end rolled off and rolled on the floor and Larry bust out laughing <laughs> and you know that was kind of the end of it there you know there's a long lineup of people so when we got back after mass was over and you know you put everything back and uh, we were changing back and the father had said uh, didn't chastise Larry he just said you know he said it's something that you shouldn't really do he said I know it was kind of funny he said rolling on in rolling on the floor but but when we got back to class, because we were doing this during we were taking catechism, the sister, oh, come unglued. Holy moly, gee whiz, you know, you're going to hell in a handbasket and you should go to confession and say, oh, my goodness. Gee, they, she was just, holy moly, you know. So that's why it was kind of nice when we did get to be altar boys that uh, got away from the sisters and we just learned, you know, we'd go over to the church uh, and practice mass and, you know, learning uh, the language, you know. And then when you move the Bible to one side to the other, and then one of us would have to get the water and the wine and, you know, which we'd always sample, of course, to make sure it wasn't poisoned before the father got there. <laughs> That's very honorable of you guys. Well, well heaven forbid. <laughs> and uh, is that, Faith, is that something you've carried on like, you know, past your, I guess, years of catechism, did that stay with you? In, in, uh, how do you mean? In terms of what? Like, did you remain, uh, I guess, like a uh, Catholic in the sense that you still go to Mass, like as an adult, or that was just back then? Just back then. I mean, midnight Mass and that, you know, at the church. But other than that, they say I have my own beliefs. As far as going to confession, if I feel the urge and I want to get down and confess, I don't need the middleman. I can get down anywhere. <laughs> there you go. And, uh, okay, if you wanted to pass on anything, and I mean anything, to any generations that will watch this, either in the near future or, you know, many years later on, uh, with regards to your heritage uh, from the Métis culture, what would you want to say to them? I would want to say to them, be proud of who you are, be proud of your culture, who you are, you know, and, and uh, just in terms of living your culture, that varies depending how you were raised. And I would just say that, you know, be strong, be a good person. I mean, uh, when you look back and look at the history, I believe part of learning is learning the history of who we are, where we come from. Because if you don't learn the history of who you are, where are you going to go to the future? You know, and, and it doesn't mean that you abide by everything. I mean, the world is such a changing place every day. I mean, we see it with this pandemic going on. It, it's one of the things that I ask, and I ask you, Marlon, and I ask everybody out there, is how will this change society? How will we change when this pandemic, this COVID thing, it's never going to come to an end. I mean, I, I think we're cognizant of the fact that it'll be like the flu shot every year. They've alluded to that time and time that, you know, and nobody's saying that if you get the flu shot every year that you won't get the flu, but they're saying that if you do in all likeliness, it will be less severe. You shouldn't have to be hospitalized and such. I myself, you know, uh, both my wife and I have had uh, double vaccinated the booster and the flu shot. You know, and, and I mean, you try and pass that along and, uh, you know, oh, I have various thoughts, but, but as far as passing on anything to any of our generations and that as an elder, it, it's be true to yourself, 
you know, be true to those that you love, those that you care about, you know, and, and that uh, always extend a helping hand. It, it never hurts to, to say hello to somebody, it's a total stranger. How was your day? How are you doing? My wife and children accuse me of, they don't like going to the store because I know so many people or just chatting with people in general. That's who I am. And then whether that's the political side of learning that, but to the true to thy own self. That's a, that's a great message. Thank you, Dan. Well, on that note, I will say thank you for being part of the Northeast BC uh, Métis Storytelling Project. It uh, was great and it was an honor to hear your story. Thank you for, uh, you know, letting me be part of it. Great. Well, and Thanks, man. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs>